our first two talks, we dealt, first of all, with the nature and the structure of Satan's kingdom. I pointed out that there are two opposing spiritual kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, both of them spiritual, both of them at this time invisible to the natural eye, but extremely real. And we attempted to trace the origin of Satan's kingdom to, a, to an archangel originally named Lucifer, who laid a group of angels in rebellion against God and set up a rival kingdom in a region which is called, in the New Testament, the heavenlies. That phrase, the heavenlies, actually occurs five times in the epistle to the Ephesians, which is the main section of scripture that unfolds God's revelation of the church. I think it's no accident that the emphasis there is on the heavenlies. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be operating in the heavenlies against another kingdom also established in the heavenlies. And for the benefit of those who are confused, I would like to point out that in the Bible from the first verse onwards, the word heaven is plural. There is more than one heaven. And somewhere between our planet and God's throne and the heaven of God's presence, there is a rival satanic kingdom in opposition to God. And then we dealt in the second talk with one of the main activities of the satanic kingdom, one of the main ways its power is manifested, which is witchcraft. For many people, witchcraft has a kind of old fashioned sound, like something from the middle ages, which has long ceased to be relevant, but that is totally untrue. Witchcraft is very real, and I think has never been more active in human history than it is today. And in many nations, which a generation ago would have been described as Christian, are today pervaded with intense activity by witchcraft. I tried to give a brief definition of witchcraft in three areas. First of all, as a work of the flesh, one of the ways that man's fallen nature expresses itself, and I gave the three key words to manipulate, to intimidate, and to dominate. The aim of witchcraft simply is to control other people and get them to do what you want them to do. And it does not use legitimate means. Witchcraft is closely allied with rebellion. It's the outworking of man's rebellion against God. In the second area, witchcraft is a sort of supernatural satanic religion with many different aspects and phases. And uh, the priest of witchcraft in most countries is called the witch doctor. And you cannot find a single uh, area of the earth's surface where people have not been engaged in witchcraft, mostly from time immemorial. And in many, many areas of the world, it is still the prevailing spiritual activity. And then thirdly, we dealt with witchcraft in the church, which is one of Satan's master strokes. Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians and he said, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? And we saw that the evidence that they were bewitched consisted of the fact that the work of Jesus on the cross had been obscured. And through that, they had been deprived of all the benefits that Jesus had obtained for them. And this work of witchcraft expressed itself in the church in two main things. Carnality, relying on the flesh rather than on the spirit, and an outworking of carnality, legalism. And I suggest to you, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, that very possibly most of the professing Christian church answers to that description. It has turned away from the supernatural grace and power of the Holy Spirit, resorts now on human methods, human efforts, and uh, is in a sense tied up in all sorts of legalistic systems. I've told people in some places that Christianity is not a set of rules. And sometimes people have looked at me in amazement. I think they could almost more easily have accepted the statement if I'd said there is no God. Well, this evening we're going on to the next main outworking of Satan's kingdom and Satan's opposition to God and to the Church of Jesus Christ. And we're going to deal with something that I have headed, the spirit of Antichrist. We need to turn first of all to the passage in 1 John where this is primarily described. 1 John chapter 2 beginning at verse 18. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Notice that the advent and the working of the spirit of Antichrist is going to intensify the closer we get to the end of the age. 
they, that's these antichrists, went out from us, uh, us being the church of Jesus, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things, or an alternative reading, you all know, which is probably the right one. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. We see there that, let me first of all try and just briefly explain the real meaning of that strange phrase, Antichrist. You need to bear in mind, first of all, that the word Christ it's from a Greek word, Christos, which exactly corresponds to the Hebrew word Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. It's amazing how many Jews and Christians do not realize that Messiah and Christ are two different words for the same thing. So when we say anti-Christ, that means anti-Messiah. And it's probably easier for us to get the picture if we use the phrase Messiah. So, and then again, the, the preposition, I hope you know what a preposition is, if you don't, don't worry, uh, you can get by without it. Heaven is open to those who don't know what prepositions are. <laughs> but anyhow, the preposition anti is a Greek preposition, and it has two meanings, and both of them apply. First of all, it means against. So the first operation is against Messiah. The second meaning is in place of. And so the ultimate purpose, is to put a false messiah in place of the true messiah. So this force operates first of all by excluding messiah and secondly by replacing him by a false messiah. So the total operation is in two phases. And when you begin to recognize that, I think you will see that the spirit of Antichrist is extremely active almost throughout the whole professing church. Ruth and I have friends in America who belong to a church which would be called in the old line evangelical stream. I don't want to name the denomination. And they said to me one day, they said, in our church, you can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Socrates, you can talk about Plato, you can talk about Martin Luther King, and no one gets upset. But if you talk about Jesus, everybody gets upset. Now what is that? It's the spirit of Antichrist, see? It's in its first phase, getting rid of the true Messiah. But we all need to bear in mind that that's not the end of, of Satan's purpose. His purpose is to replace the true Messiah by a false Messiah. So that's what we're dealing with. It becomes obvious when you see that, that this particular operation of Satan is only applicable where Jesus has been preached. You cannot reject Jesus if you've never heard about Jesus. So witchcraft is different. Witchcraft belongs to the whole fallen human race. It is, in fact, as I said, the universal religion of the fallen race with many different manifestations and forms and ceremonies. But Antichrist can only be manifested where Christ has first been preached. In the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, it's recorded in Matthew's Gospel that he said to Satan, get behind me, which is the normal way to translate it. But it is perfectly possible to translate that, follow behind me. And I believe that is a spiritual reality, that wherever Jesus and the Gospel are proclaimed, God will permit the opposite claim to follow. In fact, humanity is going to be forced to choose between the true Messiah and the false. It's part of God's way of dealing with us that he doesn't exclude the false options. And it's our responsibility to make the right choice. I think this is extremely relevant to our generation. I believe this generation in one form or another is going to have to make a decision, true Messiah or false Messiah. And the spirit of Antichrist is extremely active, much more than most of you have any idea, pressuring us into the wrong decision.